Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome to the Salty Science Podcast, and I'm so glad you're here to join in on another Fun Science Friday, a concept and phrase coined by my grad school advisor, Mark Brush. And before we begin this episode, two things. First, I just want to say a big happy birthday to Rebecca Seibert. Today is her birthday, so Rebecca, because I know you're listening right now, happy birthday. And second, we have our very first sponsor. Woo! All right, so now it's time to get to the fun stuff. So it was requested by one of our listeners to have an animal spotlight episode. So this is our very first animal spotlight episode, and we'll be featuring the Atlantic sturgeon. Okay, so you may be asking right now, of all the really cool animals in the ocean, why did you select the Atlantic sturgeon? Well, not only is the Atlantic sturgeon a really cool fish that is even featured in the lyrics of Disney's The Little Mermaid Under the Sea song, but last weekend, I worked a shift at the Vim's Outreach Tent at the Urbana Oyster festival in Urbana, Virginia. And one of the displays that we had at the tent featured the Atlantic sturgeon. And as different people came up to the tent, they started sharing their really cool personal experiences with the Atlantic sturgeon. Mostly how they saw this 10 foot plus fish breach out of the water as their boats went by, which I personally thought was really cool because I didn't know that this fish could do that. And then they started asking me some really great questions that at the time I was not able to answer. But as soon as I got back into an area with cell phone reception and Wi-Fi, I started doing some research. So this episode is dedicated to all the great people who asked great questions at the Urbana Oyster Festival this past weekend. Okay, so one of the first questions that I was asked was, are there different types of sturgeons? And the answer is yes. The word sturgeon is actually the common name for about 27 to 28 different species of fish, and all belong to the family Acipenseridae which is then divided into four different groups or genera. And our friend the Atlantic sturgeon is one of the 27 or 28 species, which goes by the scientific name Acipenser oxyrhynchus oxyrhynchus, which oxyrhynchus means sharp snout. Okay, so the next question I was asked was, what do they look like in real life? Well, they're big. They typically grow to be 14 feet long and weigh up to 800 pounds. They have elongated spindle-like bodies with smooth, scaleless skin. Their bodies can be bluish black or olive brown on their backs with paler sides and a white belly, which side note, this colorization pattern is called counter shading. And we see it in a lot of different marine animals. And along the sides of their very long bodies, they are armed with five rows of bony plates called scoots, which can be quite sharp if touched the wrong way. They also have tail fins that look like a shark's tail, where the top lobe is longer than the bottom lobe. But while their tails may resemble a shark tail, their mouths are very different. They have elongated toothless mouths that resemble sort of a snout, and below the snout, in what we would maybe say the chin area, they have four slender sensory organs called barbels, which makes them look like they have little whiskers. And sturgeons are often referred to as quote-unquote primitive fish because the shapes of their bodies still look very similar to the sturgeons found even in the earliest fossil record. And don't worry, listeners, I've already posted some great pictures of sturgeons on the Salty Science Weebly page, so go check it out. Okay, so another question that I was asked was, where do they live? Well, all sturgeons are native to subtropical, temperate, and subarctic rivers, lakes, and coastlines of Eurasia and North America. But the Atlantic sturgeon live in rivers and coastal waters all the way from Canada to Florida. And Atlantic sturgeons are anadromous fish meaning that they are born in freshwater, then migrate out to sea, and then back again to freshwater to spawn. And most juveniles remain in the river of birth, also known as a natal river, for at least several months before migrating out to the ocean. And tagging data indicate that these immature Atlantic sturgeon travel widely up and down the east coast and have been found as far as Iceland when they're out at sea. Okay, and the next question, what do the Atlantic sturgeon eat? Well, Atlantic sturgeon are bottom feeders. They typically look for food that includes invertebrates such as crustaceans, worms, mollusks, and bottom dwelling fish such as sand lance. And they use their elongated snout and barbels to shift through the sediment. And then when they find food, they just vacuum it up into their mouths. 
All right, and next question, how long do they live? Well, the Atlantic sturgeon lifespan is correlated with how far north or south they live. For example, the Atlantic sturgeon in Canada can live up to 60 years old, but the further south they live, they typically only live to be about 25 to 30 years old. And of course, while they live longer in the north, they definitely grow faster in the south. Okay, and the last question that I was asked at the Urbana Oyster Festival was, can we eat sturgeon? And the answer to that question is yes and no. During the early settlement of the United States, we have record that sturgeon was a key food source for early colonists. And even Captain John Smith wrote in 1609, we had more sturgeon than could be devoured by dog and man, of which the industrious, by drying and pounding, mingled with caviar, sorrel, and other wholesome herbs, would make bread and good meat. Others would gather as much togwag roots in a day as would make them bread a week, so that those wild fruits and what we caught, we lived very well in regard of such a diet. And Captain John Smith was also known for saying that there were so many sturgeons in the James River that a man could walk across the river on their backs. And harvesting Atlantic sturgeon was an important industry from colonial times all the way to the early 1900s and was an important commercial fish in the Chesapeake Bay. The Atlantic sturgeon was harvested for its delicate meat, which they say is comparable to pork or swordfish, and they were also harvested for their oil and swim bladders, which their swim bladders were used to make icing glass, which is a clear gelatin, as well as for making jellies, clarifying agents for beverages, plasters, waterproofing agents, adhesives, and even lubricants. But the most valuable part of the fish was its eggs, or roe, especially when prepared as caviar. And then by the 1800s, people flocked to the eastern United States in search of caviar riches from the sturgeon fishery, also which later became known as the Black Gold Rush. Then in 1998, the Atlantic Marine Fisheries Commission closed the entire coast to Atlantic sturgeon fishing for the next four decades because stock assessments indicated that only remnant populations of Atlantic sturgeon remained along much of the east coast. And so it was this black gold rush and craving for caviar, along with pollution, dams, and overfishing that led to the near extinction of the Atlantic sturgeon. And in 2012, they were officially placed on the endangered species list. And so to answer the question, yes, you can technically eat and consume Atlantic sturgeon, but it's illegal to fish for, catch, or harvest Atlantic sturgeon or their eggs. So while yes, we can eat them, no, we can't really because it's illegal. And that is the story of the Atlantic sturgeon. Okay, so now it's time for our one minute summary. In this episode, we put the spotlight on the Atlantic sturgeon fish, a prehistoric looking armored fish of great proportions. They can grow up to 14 feet long and weigh up to 800 pounds, as well as live up to 60 years old. They are found in rivers and coastal waters all the way from Canada to Florida. And Atlantic sturgeon are anadromous fish, meaning they are born in freshwater, but migrate to sea and then back to freshwaters to spawn. And most juveniles remain in the river of their birth for at least several months before migrating out to sea. They are bottom feeders and use their snouts and whisker like barbels to root through the sediments for their delicious diet of worms, snails, shellfish, crustaceans, and small fish which they vacuum into their soft little toothless mouths. And we have record that they were massively abundant in the early 1600s and were a key diet of the early colonists. And even up until the 1900s, they were commercially harvested for food as well as for industrial purposes. However, their population started quickly crashing because of overfishing, pollution, and the building of dams. And then in 1998, the Atlantic Marine Fisheries Commission banned Atlantic sturgeon fishing for the next 40 years. And in 2012, they were officially declared an endangered species. But there are some signs of recovery, so let's keep doing what we can to protect these amazing fish. And that's the end of our one minute summary. Okay, so now for the big question, why do we care? Well, the Atlantic sturgeon is a historically important fish. They have a very long history in the fossil record and are key players in coastal ecosystems from Florida all the way up to Canada. And we also care because the Atlantic sturgeon was an important commercial fish for hundreds of years. And while they are currently endangered, different groups are working on restoring the depleted populations, which would just be great for coastal ecosystems as well as the economy. And listeners, if you come up with any other reasons why we should care, feel free to email me at saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com. All right, so as I close this episode, I just want to once again give a special shout out to all the great people at the Urbana Oyster Festival who asked some really great questions and inspired me to search for the answers. And 
And also, before I leave, I'll remind you to go check out the Salty Science Weebly page. That's saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com because I've posted some great pictures and special links that accompany this episode. And finally, I just want to say that I'm officially recruiting Salty Science crew members. So if you like the show and would like to show your support and join the Salty Science family, you can go to the Salty Science Patreon page and join our crew today. Crew members will not only have special access to some fun content on our Patreon page, but will also receive members-only goodie bags and special shoutouts from me. So make sure you sign up today because I'd love to have you as a part of my crew. Okay, so until next time, don't forget to do your thing to keep our oceans clean and to always stay salty. Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to www.saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com where I've posted some cool videos, my study notes, and some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram user handle Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube, plus a number of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener supported, so if you would like to show your support, visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash salty science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount or join the Salty Science crew for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon and sign up today.